Thank you very much for joining us for this. Uh, this is the last of this year's um, Japan Society Northwest and JetAA Northwest Lecture Series, which is part of the Japan UK season of culture. Uh, just to let you know that uh, this evening's talk is being recorded uh, and there will be questions and answers uh, later on. So um, your voice may be part of the recording as well, so for posterity. Um, this evening, we're being joined by travel writer and Azerbaijan expert, uh, Mark Elliott. Uh, as well as writing over 70 books, uh, Mark hosts his own podcast. He's also the lead writer for the Caspian Post, uh, writing about non-political geopolitics. Uh, he also teaches English to Japanese students. And some of you uh, listening this evening may have met him in person, as he also sits on the selection panel for the JET program. Um, Mark himself originally trained as a chemistry teacher uh, in Durham University, where he was the arts editor for the Palatinate, the, uh, the student uh, newspaper, uh, alongside his contemporary, uh, Jeremy Vine. Um, the books that he's written um, are mainly travel-based, uh, and they cover everywhere across the globe, from uh, Greenland to India, uh, Iran to Laos, uh, and of course his speciality, uh, Eurasia, uh, focusing primarily on uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, where, in fact, he is a local celebrity, in fact, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that uh, in, in, the, in the lecture. So today's talk is going to take a slightly more interactive uh, format than some of the ones that we've had before. Uh, there will be a, a free discussion uh, sort of Q&A session at the end. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly keep some time for that. But if you do have any questions uh, during the talk, please feel free to just um, use the reactions uh, function uh, on here where you can so if you click on that you can raise a hand uh, for example and then uh, we can just pause and, and maybe if you have any questions to ask there and then we can deal with them uh, in real time uh, and similarly if there's something that you'd like to ask and you feel happy to put your video on that would be very much appreciated as well so that we could we can see you while you're asking those questions um, as I say there will be a Q&A session at the end but if you do want to ask anything as we're going along, then please uh, feel free to do so. We also, of course, have the chat function, which some of you are already uh, using there. Uh, so you can put any questions that you would like to ask in there, if you prefer to do that rather than asking them on, on the video. Um, so without uh, further ado, I will hand over to Mark. Mark. Hello, hello. Um, I, I've still got all these people on the screen, so um, I'm... I wish I could see you, but I can't do that. Um, the connection I have, of course, to Japan and how this uh, talk originated is I was a JET myself from 1991 to 94. Now, let's just see if this interactive thing works. C can you use the reaction button, anyone, and to, to just indicate, yes, if you were a JET participant yourself? Um if you, can you, if, you, if anyone found the reaction button, so maybe a little heart sign would pop up if you were a jet participant. I'm getting a few hearts at least. Well, that's nice. But starting off with a heart is very nice. Now, so uh, as as you've just heard, I was uh, trained as a chemistry teacher, and I was a little bit older than most jet participants when I went. I was into my twenties, so I had just a tiny little bit more experience. Um, let me show you. But anyway, so what we're talking about in this talk is how did I get to this, which is a collection of some of the books I've written or often co-written uh, from this. Now, um, I know that the Japanese embassy is looking at this, so, so I don't want you to think that the JET program is entirely drinking, but that well, there was a major part of it. It was internationalization in, in a big way. But how did I get to that? Well, actually getting to the JET interview itself uh, proved quite uh, difficult, in, in fact, because um, initially I was here uh, in Prague, and it was an interesting time, uh, 1989, I had gone initially to uh, Berlin to watch the party, as I imagined, uh, of all the as the, the wall came down at the end of 1989. Uh, however, uh, the uh, party wasn't as much of a party as I expected. In fact, a lot of the Germans that I met were 
really quite worried by the developments and um and being a young man looking for a party i then jumped on the train uh, to prague um where the revolution was in full swing so um i ended up as a volunteer teacher for a thing called education for democracy um now one of the problems as anyone that's applied to the jet program will know is that to get to a jet interview you know, the jet interview you have to be exactly on time and getting to and from prague wasn't necessarily the easiest thing and when i did finally get there i got caught on the snow in the snow on the way to the interview a very long story but um eventually i made it um and so this was 1991 my first year i was in a place called sasebo which is a big american port but actually i was in a, a inaka kind of village on the outside but i said at the time um this this i've just dug up was the uh, self report that i described about myself after my first year in, in what we had as a, a rather nice uh, yearbook um so i requested to be as rural as possible but i still didn't think i was rural enough so um amazingly in nagasaki it was possible to be transferred and i was transferred onto about the most remote place you could get which is one of the islands uh, of the goto group in fact on this long thin peninsula now uh, for those of you who know japan from tokyo and kyoto um, you've probably been to rural Japan, but this was extremely rural Japan. Um, uh, if you look on here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but between Sasebo and Nakadorijima, there's this tiny little island. And of all my schools, uh, this was the smallest. Uh, I had to take a ferry in the morning um, because the only uh, access was by ferry. And that went once a day from my island to that island and came back again in the evening. The school had a total of, I think it was three students and five teachers. The, um, but that was only the smallest. If you look on, the, uh, on this map, the, the villages aren't marked and now those schools no longer existed. But right at the tip of the island was a school of seven students. And in between, there was a school of 12 students. I believe none of these operate anymore, but it was an absolutely marvelous experience uh, teaching that. Um, to get to the main uh, mainland, it was a three or four hour ferry ride on a somewhat rusty old ship. Now, I want to talk about how I went from jet into writing. And the way we started is we must remember the era. Uh, if you wanted to communicate with anyone at home, we didn't have WhatsApp, we didn't have internet at all, um, and to make a call home uh, was extremely expensive. The adverts that you would see in newspapers for, for foreigners would tout these numbers where you could call a little bit more cheaply. Now, the idea of the internet, the idea of the internet, stuff, stuff like Yahoo and InfoSeek Ask Jeeves. This kind of thing, if you were, um, if you are old in, as old as I am, you'll remember that this really only started working at the end of the 1990s. In 91, 92, 93, the whole idea of having any kind of even an email was beyond even our imagination. So, what we used to do amongst our group of uh, AETs, that was the name that we gave on the JET program to fellow teachers, was a thing called the NAGRAG. Well, because NAG for Nagasaki, this was within the prefecture where we worked. These were just printed, quite literally printed, um, typed up on a typewriter and um, copied. And uh, I'm not sure if you're enjoying some of the uh, slightly risque covers. I featured actually on one of the covers. Um, in fact, I, I, I just realized that I haven't actually started the, the show as a full show. So let's just run along. So uh, if, again, anyone remembers this uh, Rolling Stone cover, I was a, 
the cover star of one of our versions. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, these magazines were, I'm just pointing out that this was the only way that we could communicate back in this time. And we, uh, one of my jobs was uh, coming up with hopefully witty and uh, interesting ways uh, to suggest useful practical tips, which was all done in a slightly uh, sarcastic and rather jokey way. So um, the hitchhiking tips, um, were very, very useful and, and actually based in fact, but also it was a very much an in crew. And so cheapskate travel tips was one of my regular features in the so-called nagrag. As you can see, the uh, it was far from high tech. So this was another page we were using um, just cutouts and even handwritten stuff, uh, often taking uh, items out of the Viz comic, which was in its day a very major um, uh, major uh, uh, entertainment, shall we say, was uh, shipped out at great expense to Japan. Um, we also explained uh, the ins and outs of British English to um, our non people. Now, okay, so here's where you get to to choose. Now, um, the first one that might choose which which of these stories would you like to hear? Um, Banana King, Anarchy in the UK. Midsummer Night's Dream and Musashi Maru. Anyone like to 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 put in a comment which story they'd like to hear first? Well, no, I'm only giving you one. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Does does the chat come through? All of them. Oh, very nice. But we're not getting them all. Okay. Um, let's go with Musashi Maru. Um, now, Musashi Maru was uh, in in his day a very very um, oh. Um, yeah, Musashi Maru, that's what we're getting. Okay, lovely. Um, so Musashi Maru was uh, a very famous uh, sumo player. He uh, came from, uh, from Hawaii originally, I believe. And But he and a, the whole of his um, group of fellow... No, do we have it? No, I don't have it. I don't have any pictures. But... Um, came to our island and Musashi Maru uh, actually came to the Ryokan run by my friend. So, so he sat there and I had the idea that, that um, very, very foolishly, of course, that, that sumo wrestlers were big drinkers and, um, and that we'd have a big fun evening. But he sat there miserably looking as the rest of us tucked into uh, um, uh, as much sake as we could drink provided by the, uh, the Ryokan, but they actually, he himself was not allowed to have any. And he, he, he seemed to be quite a miserable, very lovely, charming guy, but um, it did seem to be quite a difficult life um, being a sumo player. Now, the fact that we were, um, we had the honour of them arriving at our island was, was very, very great luck because in reality, uh, I think it's only once in a, a lifetime that a whole... Uh, sumo tournament ships itself on on a privately owned a privately chartered ferry and comes to the remote islands but it was to do with one of the the great stars of the sport coming from the island okay so now let's get back to uh, the, the fact that there was no uh internet meant that there was of course no amazon and even when amazon kicked off uh in the in the 90s it was a bookshop back in our day here we have like stop press amazing you can actually get foreign books in japan now of course if you lived in japan in in tokyo that wasn't such a problem but when you lived on a little island like my own to get something like a lonely planet or a moon guide was was gold dust it was um and remember we had no internet so we literally didn't even know well I, uh, most people didn't know which countries needed visas, which countries were uh, expensive to reach and so forth. So, so putting stuff like this in our little newsletter was very helpful. Um, and here, just in, in the days of, uh, of Amazon deliveries here, they noticed that they say within the month, you might get the book delivered. So this gave me an idea. I, as I said, I had been traveling a little bit before doing JET program. I wasn't straight out of, um, of the university. So I had had some experience, including traveling a fair bit in Southeast Asia. And I had the idea, how about um, in the so-called uh, 
returnees guide, which we, which the AJET organization used to publish. How about we put a travel section in it? This was a novel idea. So what we did was we added about 50 pages um, and then rebranded this as Jet and Beyond. So in this, um, organ, uh, in this publication, um, we had all kinds of interesting adverts, um, which is interesting to see about the sort of prices people were paying in those days for flights. Um, but we also um, gave suggestions about ways you could go um, and really, really simple paired back information. Uh, like if you happen to be going via, back via various countries, this is the Middle East page, at a glance, do you need a visa? How long will it take you? Um, how how much is a cheap hotel? Stuff like that. These days, it seems preposterous because you just Google it in a second. But to have this at your fingertips was a, quite a nice idea. Now, one of the great things about um, being doing the JET program is when you left, they gave you a wad of cash to buy your flights home. And in those days, a flight home was an extremely expensive thing. Incredibly, when they worked out how much to give me to go home, they actually calculated it based on the mileage um, from where I lived in Japan to the UK, and then multiplied it by how much that would be if there was a JR train route. So it was a fair old sum. So um, now, because I'd worked on three editions of this book, I had the idea, well, there's some, something really ha interesting happening. In the Central Asia, the Soviet Union had recently collapsed, and I didn't even know the names of the countries, but I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to add a few details to that book that I'd already written? So to tell people next year, if you were to set off across China um, uh, into Central Asia, how does it work? And I literally had no idea whatever. <laughs> so what it did was um, the, the, the red line uh, approximately covers the route I took. Um, you may notice that the map itself is atrocious because in the middle here, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have, have gone AWOL, but that's, uh, uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the map maker on this. Anyway, so, so I, I nipped on a ferry to South Korea. Um, took another ferry to China, and then wended my way across China. Uh, here you see me looking a, a, a great deal younger. And anyone that tells you that the, uh, the, the Great Wall of China is something you can see from, the, from space, I, the, pictures like this really give you an idea, a sense of it. You, you, you walk much distance along it, and it's completely overgrown. Um, and if, if, if anyone is I don't know if it's still the case. Now, remember, this is 30 years ago, but uh, sleeping up on, on one of the ruined watchtowers was quite an experience. Anyway, so we crossed China, and uh, I was traveling with a friend who was an American, and he claimed that uh, he spoke Russian. And since he'd studied at university, I had no reason to doubt it. Um, but it turns out that I had learned more from uh, reading Clockwork Orange than he actually seemed to know from doing his American first year degree. Um, now, it, if you've watched the film, you may remember things like um, Horror Show Droogies, which is uh, literally is Russian for, for good friends. But actually, if you read the book rather than watching the film, there's a whole glossary at the back. And you can actually sort of teach yourself 200 words of Russian um, by having a, a copy of Clockwork Orange in your backpack. So, so by, by lucky chance, I was able to get by just a little bit. Um, now, when we got... Now, the whole issue of getting the visas is another point altogether, but to get visas to go to countries that I had never heard of was extraordinarily difficult. Wandering around Beijing, trying to find any kind of, uh, well, I, I managed to track down eventually the the, um, the various embassies, but uh, the Kyrgyz v embassy didn't give visas. The Kazakh v visa I got was for two, was I think was for five day transit or maybe two day transit. 
on an enormous country, uh, which <laughs> I think the ninth biggest country in the world. Um, but what you discovered, and this was the sort of useful stuff I could feed back, um, was that should you get into one of the countries, the, the Soviet Union had collapsed, but as yet, most of the countries hadn't yet bothered to build borders. So you could sort of on my five day or two day, I can't remember, uh, Kazakh visa, I could then nip across the border into Kyrgyzstan. And once I was in Kyrgyzstan, I discovered you could go to the ministry and say, I've got to your country. Can I have a visa now? Good luck trying that now. Now, you may be wondering why I have a Snickers uh, here. Well, remember, there's no internet. If you wanted to know, um, oh, another point being that there were also a massive black market. So what the bank would offer you for your dollars um, and what you should be getting for your dollars would be a, a matter of a factor of sometimes three, four, five hundred percent different. So you may want to know as a foreigner, how on earth do you know what is approximately the correct rate? Well, this is where the the idea of the Snickers index came in because the Snickers, which was an extreme um, luxury in, in the country, but sold in, in in these, this was a relatively upmarket store. Um, the, a Snickers would always be just under one US dollar, around about 90 cents. So if you figured that, but in the local currency, of course. So if you worked on that basis, you've got a pretty good idea of what you should be um, charging. Now, so as I say, this was the height of modernity, a, a shop like this in, in, in 94 in Central Asia. Um, this was more common. These ladies are, are making smetana, I think. Um, and this was a typical Soviet era shop, com almost unchanged since the Soviet era. And it, quite a lot of the people in the um, in the in the shop in in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and most of the stands in general seem to be sort of just waiting for the Soviet Union to come back. So you'll notice that it's um, uh, well. Okay, so the the other thing is a lot of people would come to these places, which were meant to be um, grocery stores, and then have breakfast, which might be stogram. Uh, now stogram, if you're able to see would mean 100 grams of vodka. Now, vodka in those days came in bottles which um, had a cardboard cap rather than a screw top, because as, as everyone said, well, you, nobody, nobody does not finish the bottle. Anyway, so uh, now this came as a bit of a surprise because this were, these are Muslim countries, and they said, oh, yes, yes, well, um, in the Quran, it says you should not drink wine, we drink vodka, or perhaps... Um, in another case, uh, well, the Russians drink six bottles, we drink only one. Now, th th these kind of things obviously have changed enormously in, uh, of late. And I'm not saying that there, were, there wasn't um, a degree of Islamic belief. But what was very interesting was most people were Islamic by identity, but actually really didn't have a great uh, sense of, of what that really was meant. And that has come a lot more in recent years. Now, another thing that was quite, as I say, uh, you could find that the, uh, the the borders weren't really demarcated. Well, they they, they, they they existed, but there was no there were no fences, there were no controls. Um, and sometimes, as in this place, the only way you knew which country you were on is by the currency you were charged in the truck stops. And for example, the train that went from Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan to Osh, also in Kyrgyzstan, went through nine international borders. Uh, so you, you kind of hardly ever knew where you were. Um, that, again, all changed in the mid-90s, but, but at this time it was true. Now, um, to say that it was um, that we were strange as foreigners in this area it, it is quite an understatement. There had not yet, as far as I know, been a, um, much of a guidebook. There was one Cadogan guide that we discovered came out in 94, but essentially we were the first backpackers really traveling in many of these areas, especially this particular road. Um, marked on the map as an extraordinarily major road, this linked um, 
two fairly sizable towns in Kyrgyzstan. It wasn't, it turned out it wasn't properly paved and there was no public transport. Um, I mentioned the vodka earlier and the part of the reason is this. Um, we arrived at the local police point and there were a lot of police along these roads and the police point, um, uh, the police, we couldn't really communicate with them at all, but they invited us in. And this blurry image here, um, well, can be explained by the fact that we, not only the fact that these are photos of photos, but the fact that we were extraordinarily drunk by the time this photo came, because the police uh, demanded that we drank vodka with them. And more curiously still, um, once a driver finally came by, which was the chap driving this tanker, um, they demanded also that he drink uh, two shots of vodka with them. So um, <laughs> uh, very much opposite of drinking and driving. Again, this is, remember, this is, this is the immediate post-Soviet period. Now, this road, as it turns out, also runs very close to the Chinese border. And the people who had been basically forced by the police to pick us up uh, were uh, ex-army. Uh, they'd actually bought their truck um, for what was meant to be £20,000, um, but they got a bank loan, and by the time they had to pay it, <laughs> the, the, the currency had collapsed such that they only had to pay £20, as uh, such was uh, inflation in those years. And so they were, they were happy about that, but they were very, very suspicious of, of Will, um, who was my co-writer and traveller, um, and myself, and what were we doing there? So... Um, we discovered that they spoke um, some German because having been in the Red Army, uh, the, any, any guy who was from the, from the Red Army and had to serve in, in Germany needed to speak a little bit of uh, German if he was going to um, work the black market or find a girlfriend. So we could get by on tiny little bits of my O-level German. But they were a little suspicious of us. And then when we reached the top of this pass, to my horror, the driver stopped and then pulled out a Kalashnikov. Now, a Kalashnikov is a, a sort of a rifle rather than a pistol, so he, he couldn't kill us there and then. Um, but he sort of uh, ushered us to get out of the, 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 um, the truck. So, I, you know, this is where your sort of James Bond villain ideas come to their worst. And, and I started, uh, so Will and I uh, were sort of walking around trying to kick close to the uh, truck and just the other side of it in, in an absolute farce. So, so the guy was walking around and we were hiding and he went round and round. And meanwhile, his, um, tra his the cabin mate had run at full pelt off into the distance. So I, some, you know, imagining that he just didn't want to witness the, the, the murder. Now, I, I, of course, I didn't quite work out why they'd want to be doing this anyway. But at a certain point, I thought, well, the best thing is to get close to him because it's very hard to, to kill someone with a Kalashnikov really close to. So when finally uh, he, he did actually catch up with us, he handed me the rifle and said, hey, target practice. <laughs> and it turns out that the other guy had gone to set up targets for us to shoot at. So... Um, he then, so what, what turns out to be far more dangerous in these parts was not being uh, attacked by people, but being almost uh, killed by what we call uh, terrorist hospitality. They are so friendly, so delightful um, that they killed a whole sheep for us, which was bad because um, Will was a vegetarian, but there we go. And, um, and we weren't essentially allowed to leave, um, or at least politeness suggested we shouldn't, until we had eaten the whole sheep with them, which was several days. Okay, back to writing. Well, these and many, many other adventures led me to think that I'm not quite sure that whether just sending this information back to my uh, Japanese publication with three or four extra lines about how to cross Central Asia, that probably isn't enough. And what actually came out of it was a book called Asia Overland, which was my first book. And as you can see, if you're uh, it's actually really rather, rather thick. Um, so Asia Overland um, took basically three years um, 
scribbling and hand drawing most of the maps. Um, one of the things we used to have, it, the keys are quite interesting. So Soviet atmosphere, uh, you, you, stuff that wouldn't you have now. Uh, but, Oh, and to, to finish writing it, I made several other trips. So one of them um, crossing Turkey, coming through Azerbaijan and going through Turkmenistan. Um, the idea had been um, to, to, uh, to, to, to spend more time in Turkmenistan and getting a visa for Turkmenistan is incredibly hard. Um, however, while there, instead I, I, I met a, a couple of Belgian women um, and one, uh, one of them had a five-star hotel. I had a $5 hotel um, and I needed a shower. And then uh, that eventually led her to be, her be becoming my first wife. Um, and that, uh, another, another route that I took uh, was across Iran, um, up, the, uh, up the Karakoram Highway and across China. And then later, um, I ended up staying five months in uh, in Nepal, largely because it was a cheap place uh, to to live. In so doing, I wrote the, what was actually my first book, but it's only a pamphlet to pay the rent, which of, of the hotel, which was owned by a publisher. And apparently, this is still available for about two pounds in Kathmandu. Now, in there, one of the in both of those books, a big feature is how to get visas. For those of you that don't even know what a visa is, because nowadays so many countries don't, don't have them, e even if you have got a visa, you can usually get them online nowadays. But uh, getting a visa was the single most difficult thing about travel back in those days. This is a pair of Russian visas. Um, they, were, they were the hardest of the lot. You needed um, to have an invitation letter, you had to have a certain amount of money, um, and th these were paper things, so th these are unused because uh, what I used to do is any time I got to a, a, a capital city, I would go to the Russian embassy just to see if I could get a visa. And in fact, a lot of that information became a, a mainstay of Asia Overland, the book. What I discovered um, after the borders started hardening and so that it no longer became possible uh, to just uh, flit across as easily as before, I discovered that there was a thing which I named the Visa Shuffle. Seven countries, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan had signed up to this little agreement which meant that with the visa of one, you could visit all of the other countries. Well, <laughs> Uh, at what I suspect was actually great risk to myself from the KGB, I decided to actually test this. So I, I set out with a Kyrgyz visa, um, crossed Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, I took the train to Moscow and ended up leaving Belarus into um, uh, Lithuania using my Kyrgyz visa, which to say that surprised the guards is an understatement. It also led to many arrests, but that's another point. Now, uh, another time for a little interactive moment. Uh, is there anyone that doesn't know what this is? Now, whether that's just a lack of anyone. Uh, so, uh, in the comments, who's the first to, to uh, who's the first to tell me what it is? Uh, okay, it's so. This is a, an incan. <laughs> Lipstick, nice one. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you don't know, this is an incan. I don't know how much they use now, but when I was in Japan, everything was paid in cash. We had no credit cards, and we um, to access my bank account, uh, I had to stamp rather than my incan. This is a little ink pad here. I, I still actually have the original um, here, which you take out the, the little bamboo thing and you stamp it on a piece of paper uh, or on the documents. Um, that was the main way. Uh, this is still the case, is it? Oh, interesting. Oh, thank you for that. Um, but I think you can now get credit cards. In those days, um, uh, now in those days you, oh, it's not, it's not moving on. So I'm just going to have to stop there for a second and share the screen again. Um, so from 
one slide, excuse me. So what's really, for me, again, almost unbelievable is how we managed to travel in an era where it was largely a cash economy. One little story, actually, about the cash. Um, People in my school were always paid in cash. It didn't go to the bank. And on a day where 80 teachers were receiving their bonuses, you might find that there were 80, uh, something like half a million pounds worth of cash sitting on the desk of the uh, Kyoto Sensei um, in cash. And you think, wouldn't? that be tempting <laughs> of course you'd never get off on the island with it but now but what was also interesting is this is this is a page from my guidebook when it was finally printed which wasn't until 1998 and this is uh, information taken from mastercard in 1998 about the number of outlets that would accept mastercard or eurocard in different countries now estonia <laughs> which is now one of the most internet savvy countries on earth had 1200 shops or outlets that took internet uh, took uh, mastercard ukraine 150 georgia kazakhstan kyrgyzstan none at least not until uh, my my then wife went to to introduce them to it so so you kind of wonder it was quite a dangerous thing in a sense to to wander around with huge wads of cash uh, you could take uh, a thing called a traveler's check, uh, but good luck, <laughs> good luck cashing those in some of these um, Central Asian countries. Fortunately, um, it was a very safe sort of place, and uh, I traveled a lot. Um, oh, no, there seems to be another chat here. What do we got? Uh, chop stamp, that's right, yes. So, um, and it uh, uh, seems like whenever I read the Whenever I read the comments, I lose the ability to move on. But anyway, now, my my second book or my what, what, when I what I found was with that Asia Overland book, I wanted to I, I really wanted an excuse to go back to Burma. So I wrote a next book, which was about um, how to travel just in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, to say I was being a little flippant is, is, is so I actually said, um, in terms of they, all the Lonely Planet books, you t used to give you great lists of what you should pack. Um, but if you're going to Southeast Asia, in comparison, it should be noted to Central Asia, I reckon what you need to pack, nothing at all. It's it's a very, very easy travel. Another thing that I was, my, my Japan experience gave me was not the ability to read kanji, but the ability not to be scared by it. And one of the things I wanted to do um, in my books was to try and... Uh, help people and I, I i gave people sort of a way of trying to demystify kanji um as i say we, we we've gone on areas across iran many times doing that um but even by the the time of my second book internet was still pretty dodgy um this is a 99 1999 guide um to the internet. Now, the, the fact that such a thing should even be needed is sort of intriguing. And uh, if you read the, the piece on the right, okay, what's this internet good for? Now, there's a question <laughs> I think <laughs> you would be uh, um, rather laughed out of court for asking these days. Um, and if you wanted to make yourself a web page, uh, that was the basic way to do it. Um, no fancy um, GoDaddies in those days. So as I as I say, I mean, I I met my future ex-wife in uh, in Turkmenistan. She was Belgian, and I moved to Belgium, where some of my Japanese friends came to to join us. Um, you, the the coat I'm wearing in the picture is a Bukharan coat from from Uzbekistan, um, and because I was now living in Belgium. Um, I wrote several books on Belgium, and this is an important part of what helped me to develop as a writer. A culture shock Belgium was, was essentially a portrait of my, my wife, and then uh, writing for the local magazine. Um, and, and perhaps one of the most dreadful pieces of writing ever, which was completely 
mutilated by the editors. The editors were in Singapore, um, and they took my sarcastic quips that Belgium has uh, snow and even has such um, uh, contours that two or three times a year you might even be able to ski to ski. That was changed to Belgium has rugged mountains and ski resorts. Uh, very embarrassing. As I say, I spent a lot of time in Nepal, largely because it was cheap. Um, and there uh, I basically sort of helped uh, um, an extraordinary tatty little local restaurant. Um, we, 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 we got them to let travellers draw murals on the wall. And as I say, we still didn't have much in the way of internet. Um, so what we had in these places were, and this was common in the mid nineties, um, a, a single place or a couple of places in town would uh, start a book of travellers tips so that when you got to that cafe, it was sort of all the tips that any of the travellers had made. It was a sort of a, a very, very rudimentary online database, uh, offline database. And um, so here you'd have a travel book, which we set up and we we, we got a thick book and, and details on, on if you're in Nepal, you know, how you and you were going to Central Asia, how you might do it, places to stay and, and that kind of thing. And so there was a network in those days of such places. So much so that I remember once setting off to... Um, to meet my friend in Hanoi. We hadn't got e email. We hadn't, this, so this was earlier. This is a little earlier. This would have been 95 or 96. I just said, oh, I'll see you in Hanoi. And in Extremis, there was a thing called Post Restaurant where you could send a letter to the name of a person that could pick it up from the post office. But I didn't worry about that. Uh, on arrival in Hanoi, I just went to the two or three uh, famous cafes that were known for travellers' places, stuck my name on the board and where I was staying. Uh, a few a couple of days later, I get a knock on my door at my hotel and assume that, that Will has found me, but it turned out it was uh, Natasha, a lady that I'd met in Prague years before. That was how small the travellers' world was back then. Anyway, the other thing was, Having written Asia Overland, 600, 700 pages for ultra backpackers, I discovered that a large percentage of our sales, according to Stanford's, at least in the travel bookshop in London, were being sold, uh, were sales were going to oil executives who were setting up oil businesses in Azerbaijan. That's because my uh, Asia Overland book happened to have about 20 pages on Azerbaijan, the only stuff in English since the breakup of the Soviet Union, it turned out. So I set out uh, with a lovely haircut, as you'll see. Um, and uh, amazingly, they um, in 2000, they gave me a press card um, so that I could research it. A, a wonderfully rudimentary press card it is. Uh, it, I think it looks more fake than, a, but it is actually genuine. Um, now, having a press card in Azerbaijan back then was wonderful. Um, there was a wonderful naivety about the place. They believed that, you know, I would go there and I would uh, tell all the truth. And there was a wonderful sort of sense that we really were the, the great democratic, uh, lovely people that they, we, we had sold ourselves as. Uh, that has since changed. And nowadays, the last thing you want to do is to be seen um, as a travel writer, as a... As a um, uh, as, as a member of the press. So if you're in India or if you're in Burma, I would be extraordinarily cautious to say, no, I'm a travel consultant um, because the moment you're suspected of being a journalist, it's trouble. Um, Burma has, of course, changed a lot in recent years, but tr um, writing about Burma in the early 2000s was something. Now, again, the the style of my early books was was all handwritten draws. There was no drawings. The, the maps were made by walking or driving the streets um, with a compass. And essentially, there was there, there was no Google Earth of, that you could re rely on. And anyway, in a lot of those countries, to have a GPS, which was the size of... I, I did once see a GPS, a, a, a guy from... Um, uh, BP in Azerbaijan did a hike with us uh, with a GPS, but to take it took it, the it took these large batteries and to use the GPS, um, taking about twenty or thirty readings, 
um, each reading taking about five minutes to triangulate on the, the few existing satellites, um, that would drain the batteries. Um, and it was a very, very uh, cumbersome process. Um, now, if you've been to Baku, uh, I suspect many of you haven't, but if you have, there are thousands of hotels, wonderful value, beautiful hotels. But when I wrote this, I could, this first book, I could literally mark on a map every hotel in the city. And some of them were um, uh, $2 a night. So uh, utterly dr dreadful. Nowadays, Azerbaijan is incredibly different. Um, Nakhchivan, which is, if you look on the map, is the, the little pit part marked in yellow, completely um, disconnected from the rest of Azerbaijan. A fascinating place. Nowadays, it's finally started to tout its remarkable pleasures. <laughs> pleasures, that's the wrong word, isn't it? <laughs> Attractions or, 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 um, to, to foreign tourists and is indeed letting people in. Um, it has what they call the, the Machu Picchu of of Azerbaijan or of the Caucasus, this this remarkable um, of medieval fortress ruins, which they put nice little um, lighting on the top of. But uh, when you when I first went there, there's a tiny little border from from Turkey, which is hard to see from the map. Um, but back in the early nineties or mid nineties, it was so corrupt that um, the the border guard literally took my passport from me, um, put it in his pocket and says, where's your passport? Uh, well, I've just given it to you. But where is it? And it was, of course, uh, um, uh, when, 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 when I realised I just had to shut up and then a guy in black appears. Oh, I believe you have a problem. Maybe I can help. So it was a matter of discussing the price. That's all changed now. Now, one of the advantages of living in Belgium was back then there was a, a, an airline called Sabina. Um, <laughs> such a bad experience never again was how the Belgians uh, claimed that they'd come up with the acronym Sabina. Uh, it long since went bankrupt, but not possibly because they paid so well for travel writers. So to write for those magazines was wonderful. Um, now, because I had lived briefly in West Africa, I had the idea to, and, and they had a wonderful um, network of flights to African cities. I thought, well, uh, a nice idea would be to go and write about a successful aid project in Africa. Now, at that stage, there weren't many, and um, but the, the article I wrote about was a wonderful one where to save this bird, um, uh, the Bannerman's Taraco, I think it was, was the name, uh, the the whole of the forest had to be saved to save the bird. It was sponsored by ornithologists, but had done an enormous amount recognising that the people of this area needed uh, alternative uh, wealth creation schemes um, so that they didn't just cut down the forest for, for firewood. It was a very successful project, um, and I wrote about it for them for that magazine. But I want to point out that part of the thing about being a travel writer is that you get multiple angles on things. So I also got to write uh, about this guy who was one of 182, I think it was maybe 180 kings of his own little kingdom. And it was the forest where the bird lived was between the two kingdoms. And that ended up with an entirely different <laughs> story. Uh, my intrepid, uh, my tales for intrepid Africa um, which was a big contrast because in getting to see the bird, uh, I happened to stumble on a tribal war between two of those kingdoms. Again, um, so you, know, you, you end up in some interesting circumstances writing even for an airline magazine. Now, back in those days, um, if you wanted to, uh, uh, well, I was often asked to make speeches at what were known as the independent travel affairs and uh, where various uh, magazines would sponsor speakers to come and explain things. Now, if you look, here's a slide from one of my things. You know, none of this, no beamers, no, no, you know, you, you got, you got your old slides in a carousel and then you had an overhead projector. Um, if you've never heard of an overhead projector, that's something you need to look up. Um, but so you'd put these, these um, acetates down and you'd draw uh, on the maps in a very, very, Basically, but anyway, because I was going to one of these, um, 
well, several of these fairs, I ended up on a, on a panel with a guy called Tony Wheeler, uh, who in in his day was really quite famous because he'd founded a, a, a guidebook company, um, which in its day was very, very famous, called Lonely Planet. And so um, I, I made a bit of a stir because I took my trousers off. Um, that was <laughs> a way of, of demonstrating that I had actually three layers of, for safety. And I, I, I mentioned earlier how uh, taking care of large wads of cash <laughs> was actually uh, a, a difficult part of, of being a traveller in those days. And, and I did it by having um, not only a money belt, but a pair of shorts with secret things and areas in that so that you could get rid of your money belt if um, attacked. Anyway, so that led on to me being engaged as a travel writer. And these are, uh, as a travel writer for Lonely Planet. And uh, uh, you, it's a very different thing for Lonely Planet because you get to write um, part, or you're part of a team. Um, now, even Lonely Planet used to make mistakes. This is my Laos book, one of three writers on Laos. Um, the two books may look similar until you get inside and you may notice, as I very quickly did, that my name has been misspelt in one of the versions. Uh, they didn't pulp it, but they did at least correct it. Now, one of my earlier jobs, well, no, middle, uh, around 2005, um, I got the job with Sri Lanka to do Sri Lanka, and I was sent to the northernmost section. Now, if you haven't followed... Um, the 20th century history of Sri Lanka. The, the, if you look at the map, you see this sort of curious area that's in a different color. That was actually controlled by the Tamil Tigers, um, which was a, a terrorist group, the, the, the terrorist group that actually invented suicide bombing. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're proud of that, but that, uh, but so they had a, an absolutely terrifying um, reputation, but actually uh, it wasn't, the, the reality was it was just a fairly peaceful area to travel through. Um, and I happened to be there in the elections, in the 2005 elections. Um, now, what was what was curious was the brief, um, when you write a travel guide, um, you're told what they want you to change, what you want to, uh, what you should be updating, and, um, and, and even what tone they want you to take. And the last edition had said that it was a little bit negative. The coverage was a little bit negative about the region. Well, after the election, it, I was quite convinced that, well, it was going to lead to war because the election went the wrong way. Um, so, but I was in a bit of a, of a quandary because if I, if I said, well, there's going to be a, a war, then they probably wouldn't have published my stuff. So it was uh, all rather, rather awkward. Um, the photo on the right isn't my own, but it, I couldn't find a nice version of it. That's um, uh, if you want a tip, if you're ever going to take the Trans-Siberian Railway, and you get to you want uh, the time to do it is in the month of March, and that is because um, crossing Lake Baikal, the world's deepest lake, is not very is incredibly expensive in the summer, impossible in spring and autumn, but in March, you can drive across it. And this is the ice, about 90 centimetres thick on the world's deepest lake, quite an experience. And um, I wrote a whole blog about that. Um, I think we're probably running out of time, aren't we? But yes, so Azerbaijan, I, <laughs> I've written multiple books on Azerbaijan since. Um, I, I, I would say anyone doing travel writing should get a speciality and um, mine is not covering myself with mud, but um, finding crazy little places like this mud pool in Azerbaijan. And I've done various videos. Here I am. I'm not sure if I'm being interviewed or interviewing. Um, so there we go. And um, I think I'll just finish it off with a little story um, on the Greenland book, which uh, a lot of the problems with the writing a guidebook is you don't get to write you don't get to write the most fun stories um so i went to a place called apilatok and there's i think six ferries a year that get you there so while there i was stuck for well a week or two um and it's a village of 105 people but utterly utterly beautiful um as you'll see it's a, a gorgeous place um now you've got to work out what to do when you're stuck there so i i I got to meet some uh, of the local Inuit um, seal hunters who then took me out for a ride down the fjord. Utterly beautiful. Um, 
The trouble was then they spotted some seals and they followed them. And we followed them and followed them and followed them until we ended up in the right through the other side of the fjord in the Atlantic. And then this happened. That is about five kilometers out into the Atlantic and the ice just came together and trapped us. Uh, and I was essentially thought, well, that's it. A, a nice place to die. <laughs> a very beautiful place to go. Um, in the end, we that little boat, we had to essentially a mixture of carry and um, push the sides of the boat while um, to push apart these huge lumps of ice. That Now, you what you had to do is push it, but then do a back somersault into the boat. If you fell in, into the water, um, I'm afraid that would be a certain death. Um, now, to get back, um, when, when finally, we amazingly, we did manage to get into a chink of open water and then came up dodging the icebergs all the way back to the village. Um, but it, by this stage, it was dark and there was no lights on the boat. Fortunately, um, at the perfect moment, the northern lights came out so brightly that we could just about find our way back. OK, um, now. Uh, I, I won't bother. I, I think I think I've said enough. Um, so I just want to to just say so. A feeling of thankfulness is what what I feel about being a travel writer. I'm thankful for being a travel writer, but I'm also thankful because I meet so many people, so many great people, and all you hear these days in the news is of a world that's dangerous, of a world that's somehow falling apart. But my experience is that people are wonderful wherever you go. People are lovely. The Japanese already showed me what how how kind and hospitable people are but wherever i've been people have been utterly lovely and i would just advise you all to go travel and have a wonderful time mark thank you very much indeed that was absolutely fabulous and very fascinating um brought back a lot of memories of, of my uh, backpacking days a little bit later on than you um, early 2000s, sort of late 1990s. So we we already had um, the internet, but uh, some very um, some some of the things that you talked about certainly rang a few bells. Um, we did. Uh, I do have a couple of questions that came in um, during the talk, so I'll um, just briefly put those to you um, at the end and maybe give you a a little bit more to talk about. Um, one of the questions that came in actually on from two people was. Would you say that modern travel, because it's easier and obviously, you know, there's so much more information available, is less exciting than it was back in those days? Um, or do you think, you know, there are still ways to do it where you can still have maybe not the same, but, but sort of similar experiences? It's a really good question. Um, I think it was easier to have a wonderful time because everything was strange and you, you one of the things now you kind of look up where you're going before it's almost hard not to have a preconception of places and you can you can find a hundred photos of almost anywhere um and i think uh, one of the things i've even noticed um the the briefs that you get from um uh, from travel writers, from from travel editors now, is more and more top tens. Uh, I, I recently did the Lonely Planet Guide to the Netherlands, and what was really interesting was how the the sort of third tier cities are being sacrificed, even from the guidebook, because um, more and more people want to go more detail on the main places. And whereas in the old guidebooks you would have all kinds of little details just thrown in to, to put you off the center and to send you to little uh, interesting places and give you just enough um, information to be dangerous. Um, these days, you, you're you more guided into the top tens. But that does mean that there's an awful lot of these sort of third tier cities, even in well-known countries, that are really only known to uh, local travelers. Um, and then if you go to places like Iran, I mean, Every time I go to Iran, and I've been, what, six or seven times now, every time I go, I'm so sort of, oh, it's dripped into me, this idea that somehow uh, Iran's a dangerous place. And and every time I get back there, I'm like, oh, no, of course, it's just Iran. And it's the most hospitable place. People 
people, there's a thing called taroof, so you have to be a little careful because um, people will offer you so much and you're meant to say no. But still, the, the, the level of genuine hospitality is enormous. And um, so, like, Iran is just a tremendous place to go. Admittedly, you're in a disadvantage if you're British. I have, I'm lucky I've got my Belgian passport, so you can travel completely freely. You can get a visa easily. British people need to go with a travel guide. That sounds like you're going to get into a sort of big brother kind of situation, but it's not true at all. So even if you go as a Brit, and I have tried it once on my recently on a British passport, um, you just basically are assigned a travel guide, a, a travel, um, yeah, a guide who is just taking you around and actually gives you more insights in a way than you'd get otherwise. So, so places like Iran, uh, Russia, again, Russia is off the radar for people. There's, there's probably less tourists going to Russia than now than there were 15 years ago, I think. Again, it's demonized a little bit, and getting the paperwork sorted is really difficult. But, um, I mean, Chechnya has just opened its, its tourist board, uh, if you're really daring. But doing the, doing the Trans-Siberian, um, if anyone does the Trans-Siberian, A, not only do it in March, but do not buy the through ticket. Do not buy it. It's because there are classes of train that go between every Siberian city. You arrive, you leave at night, you wake up next morning, you sleep on the train, and then you have all day in whichever town you arrive at. Um, Tobolsk is fantastic. Tomsk is great. Um, don't worry, with, don't bother with Novosibirsk. But there's some wonderful, Cheetah is fun. And there's some brilliant cities that you can get off at, spend all day there, and then get on the train again at night. There are, you have... Um, at every railway station, you have a baggage place where you can leave your bags. So, you know, and then it's cheaper to sleep on the, the third class trains. You still get a, a, a bunk and it's still and it's cheaper than actually staying in a hotel. So you can work your way across the Trans-Siberian for about half the price of a single ticket and yet spend loads of time in all the places. But I would say the, the, the visas are troublesome. Does that? Sorry, I've I've gone off at a tangent again. <laughs> no, that's that's quite all right. Um, we we do have another question that came in right in the middle of, as you were saying that, which was: Is there anywhere that you wouldn't go to again, or wouldn't recommend? I suppose um, either because it was too dangerous or too boring, or or for any other reason. I, uh, when I don't like a place, I usually blame myself for not trying hard enough. Um, I I struggled. I have to say. Some parts of Pakistan I find really difficult. Um, the 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 level of um, what's almost it, now it, again it's changed a lot. I have it's a while since I've been. Um, so there are parts of Pakistan where it's still almost feudal, and, and the, the people are, you know, their lives are very very hard, and and a, so the sort of sexual harassment is really quite severe and that's as a guy uh, as, as for a woman it would be very very difficult but i, I do stress that there's only parts of pakistan and there are some absolutely glorious parts of pakistan so if you got you know the, the hunza region the, the where the people are um somewhat more have, have a different form of islam which is extraordinarily relaxed uh, very similar in a way to uh, tajikistan and and the wakan corridor in afghanistan um that so the, you know it, it, so there's lovely, lovely parts of Pakistan, but if there's anywhere that I find really difficult, it's parts of Pakistan. Uh, Bangladesh is really short on things to see, and if you kind of get people just come and stare at you. Again, talking about being off the radar, Bangladesh, because there's not a great deal to see, uh, you are, will be an enormous celebrity. And if that's what tickles you, well, great, but it can be very, very tiring. Um I remember having a dinner in Silet in a, in, a, in the local in just a local restaurant, and sixteen people I counted them came off the street. I was the only person in the restaurant that at that time, and they all came and stood around my table and stood there the entire meal to watch me eat. And that's uh, it can be a little tiring, shall we say? <laughs> yep, um, I think uh, some of <laughs> similar experiences in some uh, some of the uh, more off the beaten track um, places. I think we've just got time for one uh, one more quick question, um, which is that um, obviously with COVID, um, which has been you know going around the world and, and affecting a lot of people's travel plans, uh, and also 
something of a sort of a bit of a backlash against you know some aspects of globalization some countries starting to look a little bit a little bit more inward um what is your feeling about the future of international travel where do you think it's all going to go where is it all going at the moment do you think it's going to recover and and or is it going to go back to to being a more you know challenging um as it has been you know maybe 30 or 40 years ago well yeah i, I was at the world travel market a couple of weeks ago i'm in london and uh it, you know, coming at the same time as COP, having them talking about ways to make sustainable travel uh, was sort of, it, it's very, it was a difficult discussion. Um, I think, I, I, I'm not so sure that COVID will have a very long-term effect, but I think that, I think people, people have questioned themselves a little bit. I think one of the things that's actually most interesting and most discouraging about travel is actually now if you do travel and you're going to travel as a sort of selfie top 10 traveler then you might want to ask yourself do you really need to go um, now obviously since i write travel books and i know a lot of livelihoods depend on on tourism you know i don't want to discourage tourism but but i i, I think the kind of tourism that i would really encourage is is perhaps it's an old fashioned sort of tourist, but put your phone away. <laughs> Don't, I mean, one of the things that's really, really dispiriting I find is finally seeing all the travelers who are constantly checking their uh, social media accounts. And really they are, the travel has become a background. What, we're, what they're seeing is not, it, they're looking at themselves in their phone and looking for the best backdrop and the degree to which there is a real interaction with places is questionable the other thing is as a, again a travel guidebooks are increasingly asking us as writers to write about experiences and now while a lot of those experiences are yes how do you get to know the culture sadly a great number of them are, are how to do you know how to play golf how to find coffee that you like you know your your style of coffee how to find rather than how to immerse yourself in the culture now there are there are things to do with that but i think increasingly a lot of people are traveling where you know i'm i want to run that race i want to see formula 1 i want to uh, and those those kind of activities bring in more money for the countries certainly but i wonder whether they enrich the traveler in the same way as I say, I, I feel, I feel that having travelled and having just sensed how kind and how wonderful people are around the world, as I said earlier, that that is the single one insight that I think travel really brings you. And um, also, you you realise that all the nonsensical, unidimensional representations of cultures and of religions um, are basically nonsense. Mark, thank you very much indeed. That was really, really fascinating. Um, we'll maybe even have you back uh, in the new year. Um, so if, <laughs> if you're amenable. So uh, with that in mind, we will be breaking for Christmas. So there won't be uh, a lecture uh, in December, but we'll be starting again uh, in January. And we're currently putting together uh, all the speakers for a full season right the way through next year. So we look forward to having you all join us again for that. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks again to Mark for a fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>